The commission consists of nine residents of the city of Troy, supported by the mayor and confirmed by city council. Attending tonight's meeting is our planning staff, our city attorney and planning consultant. The appropriate time anybody wishing to address us should sign in at the podium, speak to us, tell us who you are and your concern. And with that, um, I always hesitate because I'm wrong. Uh, Kathy. Mr. Edmonds. Yes. Mr. Hudson. Here. Mr. Crant. Here. Mr. Maxwell. Mr. Zanzika. Here. Mr. Schultz. Yes. Here. Mr. Strat. Here. Mr. Tagle. Here. Mr. Allman. Here. We have uh, a full house almost. The next item is the approval of the agenda which has been submitted to you. Mr. Schultz. Mm -hmm. Second. Mr. Edmonds. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Schultz, Mr. Edmonds moved and uh, seconded the approval of the agenda. Kathy. Mr. Hudson. Yes. Mr. Crit. Yes. Mr. Zanzika. Yes. Mr. Schultz. Yes. Mr. Strat. Yes. Mr. Table. Yes. Mr. Orman. Yes. Mr. Evans. Yes. Mr. Maxwell. <laughs> the agenda is approved. Next item is the approval of the minutes of the May 10th, 2011 regular meeting. Any additions or corrections to those, Mr. Tangle? Move as submitted. Mr. Exactly. Schultz supports. Any discussion? Kathy, roll call, please. Mr. Crent? Yes. Mr. Maxwell? Yes. Mr. Zanzika? Yes. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Strat? Yes. Mr. Tangle? Yes. Mr. Allman? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Item four is the public comment portion of the agenda for items which are not on the agenda tonight. Does anybody wish to address us for an item which is not on our agenda? Seeing no one, we'll go to item number five, zoning board of, zoning board of appeals report. I think it's a misprint on our agenda. Zoning board of zoning. Is that you, uh, Mr. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Strath. Thank you. Uh, there were two items that were on the agenda that were uh, discussed. Uh, the first item was the St. Joseph Catholic, uh, our Chaldean Catholic Church, uh, which uh, uh, the uh, applicant was not present, and uh, it was voted uh, no for the approval. Uh, it was felt, and I, I mentioned the fact that we had a hearing here, and then they had a hearing which they postponed twice at the CBA meeting. So therefore, I thought that uh, the people that attended to argue against it, especially the people that were adjacent uh, residents, uh, the condominium, there were some that were there, and they weren't there, and they came back and forth, so I felt that it was necessary, so I, I, uh, I did not initiate it, but I expressed my concern that I was going to vote against it. The second item, which was a variance uh, for the uh, uh, three parcel split, which was actually postponed. So that was the only real item that was on the agenda. But then afterwards, after that, at the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting, there was an election of officers as well. Prior to that, we had a 6.30 meeting that actually they reviewed, and Paul was kind enough to review all the items that were associated with the ZBA as it relates to the new zoning ordinance. So that was also presented, which I thought was very good. So that's my report. Thank you, sir. <coughs> the Downtown Development Authority, do we have a report? There's no report, there's no meeting. All right, and the Planning and Zoning Report, do we have one of those? Yeah, the, there's a, a couple of projects uh, in the hopper for, for the next meeting. Uh, one is a uh, another uh, doggy daycare facility on uh, Maple. Apparently, a lot of people have, have dogs, dogs. dogs. Yeah. and don't like their dogs to be left alone during the day. I must <laughs> I must be abusive with mine. Um, they stay home. Uh, there's a group daycare home uh, application special use for uh, it's uh, north of north north side of Square Lake Road. Um, you'll be seeing that it's uh, I don't want to get in my head myself because we don't have an application in front of us, but it's for it's an existing it's an existing uh, um, adult foster care small group home, and they want to become a large group home and add two beds basically. Um, but you'll be seeing that, and it appears those of you who remember Granite City yeah. restaurant, mm -hmm. they're um, 
<coughs> they're back up, moving forward, and um, if everything goes as planned, they'll be the first application under the Big Beaver Form Based Code provisions, and they'll have a nice uh, large restaurant close to Big Beaver in a very prominent location, and uh, I think the timing's great for that. So hopefully we'll have an application in soon. Right. When they were before us, was that just for a study <coughs> session? Well, well, they had a site plan approval. They were approved. They, were, uh, they received uh, preliminary site plan approval. Maybe it was maybe special use approval. And they actually went all the way through final, paid their fees and everything, and they were ready to go. And uh, the, the, with the economy, the timing of the economy and, and, uh, and whatnot, that was put on hold. Um, they've essentially kind of rebranded the restaurant, redesigned. Uh, architecturally redesigned the, and come up with a new uh, a new model for their uh, for their uh, rep, for their building, but it's very attractive, about the same size, and uh, they're on board with with what we're what our objectives are with Big Beaver Corridor, Big Beaver Corridor, and you know the relationship of the building to the street. And I look, I can't wait to see the application. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the uh, Zach, you want to talk really briefly about the. Uh, Oh yeah, uh, in the zoning ordinance, we approved uh, in uh, the article about environment and sustainability, we approved the sustainable development option. And then we said shortly after, like the rules and procedures for that were going to come. But well, we have, those are all fully developed now, and they're just going through sort of staff audit before we get them in front of you guys to, um, you won't have to, uh, it's not a formal amendment or anything to the ordinance, it's just you'll just adopt them, you know, like you would your bylaws or something. And then um, we'll have to appoint two members of the Planning Commission to be members of that committee that, if you read their provisions, you remember, there's a committee that's three staff members and two Planning Commissioners that just make a determination whether they meet the SDP and then they're a pre-qualified SDP and they're entitled to whatever those rights are. Um, in the zoning ordinance, of course, the legal department, everybody will look at it as well. Um, I, th I think it's pretty neat. It's like uh, there's, there's kind of a table similar to the zoning ordinance and there's uh, prerequisite measures that they would have to take depending on what area of the ordinance they're seeking the flexibility in. You remember there was like seven areas in the ordinance, like parking in the front yard in the IB district. There's um, a waiver on lot coverage for our, our landscaping. You could have less landscaping, all those things. And then uh, what we did was we created a table of all the potential uh, areas of sustainable development measures you could do and then tied them directly proportionally to the things that they would be seeking a waiver from. So for instance, I'll go through this in more detail next meeting, of course, but you know, for instance, if you wanted to have less landscaping on your site, what are the problems with that? Well, stormwater, heat island effect, you know, those things. So as a prerequisite, you would have to do the two uh, measures that are designed for stormwater quality and stormwater quantity. Those are prerequisites. You do those two, and then you pick one additional qualifying uh, measure. So you'd have to do two, three measures. Now, usually you do one big improvement that might actually you know, meet the requirements of storm. Like I put in a nice big rain garden that it improves quality and quantity so you could meet both of those with that, for instance. So anyway, it's this sort of simple system that, you know, there's about 20 different things you can do. There's about seven areas of the ordinance you can get waivers from and then it kind of works that way. So um, we'll get that in front of you. I'll do a, a more in-depth presentation and probably give you a, like a sample project and how it might apply. And then, um, you know, hopefully the, the planning commission will accept it and then uh, we can go through the procedure to appoint a couple members. And it's almost like having our own lead system, but it's yeah, it's really simple. Yeah, it's way simpler. The, the, the original uh, idea was to have points and all that, and there's not that anymore because um, you know the, the you know anything <coughs> that we ask for has to be directly proportionate to you know the the effects that it's causing. They have to be tied to each other. So we're not asking you to, for instance, you know, put in LED lights because you want to have less landscaping. You know, those mm -hmm. two things have nothing to do with each other. So. Um, you know, everything is tied directly to the, the negative impacts of whatever you're asking for, so. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Strat? Yeah, could I have a question? Uh, are you defining the, uh, the terminology of, let's say, the rain garden? Are you going to actually define what a rain garden really is? Well, that's the, that's the purpose of the committee. Uh, so, because, you know, it's kind of hard to determine, like something like a rain garden, you know, my rain garden and your rain garden might not be the same rain garden. Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm, if I'm, you know, a national corporation trying to build a restaurant and you're a planning commissioner, our opinions might differ, but the, you know what I mean? The, um, you'll, you'll see when you read the document, but it basically it gives, that's the reason that we have that step with the committee. Uh, because the committee, as a member of five, you have an engineering department representative, you know, you have a planning department representative, you have, you know, two planning commissioners, and then, 
I don't think we defined the three staff members yet, did we? I don't remember. Yeah. Um, but the idea is to have, you know, engineering and planning staff there in the room and, uh, you know, the natural features professional and then a couple planning commissioners. And then you make a determination as a group whether or not you feel that it meets. And what it says, and you'll see this, is it'll say, like, you can do, you know, any of these features. It won't have a definition of rain garden, but it'll say that the applicant needs to demonstrate to the committee's satisfaction that it would do it. So, for instance, if you're putting in some sort of, uh, let's say you're putting in a green roof and you can quantify according to the manufacturer of the green roof system that, you know, X number of, you know, blah, 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 and they can actually say this is the stormwater benefit of this system that we're putting in and then this is the impact of the new impervious surface we're adding, you know, those two things need to be proportionate. So that's, that's and then the committee says, okay, yes, we feel that your proposal meets this. Or they can say, no, we don't think it meets this and we're, gonna, we're not gonna accept this, it needs to be better than that. That's why there's that committee level because it's impossible to, you know, to define all those types of terms. See, the bioswale could be any number of right. things, yeah. I mean, that, you know, it. I think we have our first nominee for the committee. That's why we built in that committee level, you know, but if you want to do that, because you are getting latitude in the ordinance, uh, you know, it, it's not a waiver, it's not a variance. I mean, these are things that are built into the ordinance. It says right in there, you don't have to meet this requirement if you're a sustainable development project. I so, you know, it's um, proportional. I understand. Yep. But then, yeah, that's, that's the purpose of the committee, to make that determination. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's another, another, uh, Area of flexibility in the zoning ordinance. Yeah, we, we actually talked to somebody about it today that has a situation where it may, it may, you know, save a, a business from having to leave Troy. To be honest, so you know, we'll we'll see what happens. Okay, um, item eight, preliminary site plan uh, review, file number SP one eighty six A. The proposed sunset plans a CVS Pharmacy drive through in northeast corner of Long Lake and Liberty. Specifically, 125 East Long Lake, uh, Section 10, currently zoned Neighborhood Node M District, which is controlled by a consent judgment, mm -hmm. which leaves us with a uh, review process uh, with no decision making authority. Uh, right. Zach, go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, this is a consent judgment project, so the Planning Commission's responsibility in this situation or obligation is to provide a recommendation to City Council uh, one way or another or with conditions. Uh, that you feel should be incorporated into their final decision. What will happen is they will amend the consent judgment, or um, you know, uh, or maybe it'll be permitted under the consent judgment. I'm, I'm not sure what the process would be at the level. If you have any questions about that, I'm sure Alan can help out. But um, at any rate, it's a consent judgment project. So uh, what we did was we reviewed it for compliance with the zoning ordinance, as if it's a regular project. This is what we do with every you know consent judgment. We say, okay, well, if this just came in the door, what would the regulations be? Now, given that it's a consent judgment, the city does have some latitude on interpreting those rules or applying those rules. That's usually why it was a consent judgment in the first place, as you well know. Um, but what I will do is go through the steps of the ordinance uh, that we took a look at and uh, show what we believe is, is or is not in compliance, and the Planning Commission can act however you, however you feel after that. Um, we did not review, obviously, the entirety of the site for the existing conditions out there. You know, I, I didn't look at parking numbers for the overall project and that we looked at the specific proposal for this um, uh, because none of the other uh, elements of the ordinance were impacted in terms of their compliance. And again, it's a consent judgment. So you can see what the applicant is intending to provide uh, is the CVS pharmacy needs a drive-through window uh, to be competitive with all the other pharmacies that have been constructed in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, let me say right out that we have no objection to the provision of a drive-through window for a pharmacy. They generate uh, relatively low traffic and there's something that, um, you know, is, is just a matter of course now with pharmacies. You know that very well. All the standalone pharmacies in town have got them or they're retrofitting to put them in. Um, we like the fact that a CVS is an anchor tenant in an existing shopping center here rather than being a standalone. Uh, so we don't have a problem with incorporating it. Uh, that said, you know, uh, retrofitting it onto this building brings up a couple of issues in terms of ordinance compliance uh, that I'm going to hit on, uh, but nothing, uh, nothing that I don't think that we can resolve as a group uh, with the applicant. Um, again, this is a uh, zone neighborhood node, but uh, it kind of uh, goes out the window a little bit because of the status. Um, now, the, the actual permitting, permitting of a drive through would be allowable as a special use were this under conventional zoning because it's a site type A, street type A in one of our neighborhood nodes. And use group six, which is the automotive dominant type uses, are permitted but only under special use. That includes drive throughs, it includes gas stations, it includes car washes, that kind of stuff. So. Um, it's not a uh, it's not a use out of left field either. It's a use that would be permitted through our process. 
Um, a couple of things. Uh, the first thing that we looked at, of course, was circulation, stacking, uh, you know, the, the parking situation out there, and a couple of issues that uh, I wanted to bring to mind in terms of compliance with the ordinance. It's a little bit awkward, the design. Is this, is this kind of pointer, here? pointer on the blue. Okay. Um, you know, we feel that it's a little bit awkward in terms of on-site circulation here because, uh, in this drawing, you can see it, but this is the two-way maneuvering lane right here. And then the lane, you know, makes a sharp turn here, and then you have a double load, and then they would both presumably go left out to the entrance back to Long Lake here, or back recirculating into traffic. You could theoretically also go this way. Let me sh let me show them. Okay, the right there. So you know, you've got this situation here where you've got cars, you know, coming in here that would have to make a very sharp right, or cars that are coming in here are going to have to cut across potentially oncoming traffic right here as they're coming around the corner. It's a little bit awkward. It may not be something that is easily resolved, but I feel that. Um, you know, some additional striping, you know, uh, some arrows here, some additional signage, some, some additional sort of uh, meat on the bone in terms of making sure that everybody knows their right place right there. You know, even if it was just a couple of directional arrows uh, could be of assistance. So um, nothing major there, just some, some additional striping to make sure that it's very clear that there's a traffic crossing over at that point. Um, the, uh, this area right here, is uh, appears to be proposed as just striping this little island area right here. Although the the canopy, I'm sorry. I'm gonna zoom in. Yeah, that'd be great. It's uh, striped here. You can't read that right there, but it basically says that it's striped. Um, you know, we would like this to be a curved land. Any t any sort of a separation would be better if it was a curved risen landscape island. And then there's a, a constructed canopy that goes over top of it, um, uh, right there. So that would be uh, something that would that would assist. Now, uh, it's our understanding that the reason that they have, to, even though they only have a couple stacking spaces, and admittedly it's an extremely low volume drive-in or drive-through facility, <coughs> these don't, if you've ever used them, I don't know how many of you use these, I've used them for my, my grandparents before, it's usually there's nobody there, it's just quick in and out. It's not like a McDonald's restaurant where you have peak hours, they function all the time, they're, they're pretty spread out. But um, the, uh, they have a drop off and a pick up window. So uh, I believe that that's what this configuration is. The applicant can confirm that or, or deny it or explain to us what the situation is there. But um, so, so we recognize that that's the model there. You know, that being said, um, there is a provision of the ordinance that does cause us a little bit of an issue here. Oh, first I want to mention these barrier free spaces. We would prefer to see the barrier free spaces located over here and no spaces right there for the same reason. If you've already got this existing traffic conflict that we're going to, or this new found traffic conflict, it would be better if these two spaces were not there. There's plenty of spaces in the overall development. Given the entrance of the place right here, you know, maybe we could put barrier-free spaces somewhere in this row, uh, and that would be a big help, I think, overall to the project. Now, uh, on to the drive-through facility standards. As I mentioned, this is a permitted use, but it's permitted by special use. Uh, the new zoning ordinance does have uh, standards for drive-through facilities. When you have a pharmacy drive-through facility, you remember the old ordinance used to require nine stacking spaces for any drive-in, period. The new ordinance breaks it down in terms of use. We have banks, pharmacies, restaurants, and all that. Pharmacies require four stacking spaces per window. Obviously, this is not compliant with that. They've got three and two. Um, that, that, to me, is not the biggest uh, issue. Uh, if the applicant can justify that that's the correct number of stacking spaces for them, uh, you know, maybe the Planning Commission wouldn't have a problem with that. Again, it's a recommendation to Council anyway. Um, but what I do take a little bit of an issue with is that the fact that it is double loaded here, even though, um, you're not going to have two long lines and the ordinance clearly, you know, if you have two windows, the ordinance is clearly thinking that they're going to be like, you know, restaurants or banks, you're going to have a heck of a lot of cars piping through there. But the ordinance does specifically state that single lane drive throughs can be permitted, you know, on the side of a building, no problem, you know, tuck them in anywhere. It says double lane drive throughs have to be located only in the least visible place on a property. And it specifically says that it, in fact, the actual language is, uh, single lane drive throughs may be located on the side of a building. Multiple lane drive throughs shall be located in a manner that will be least visible from a public thoroughfare. Unfortunately, this is the most visible from a public thoroughfare on this entire site. It's on the southernmost facade, closest to Long Lake Road, and technically it's not compliant with the ordinance. Now, you know, however the Planning Commission wants to, um, you know, interpret that, given that these are extremely low volume, these are not fast food restaurant type things. Um, ideally, you know, Ideally, what we would like to see is for them to, you know, go down to one lane, just to have, you know, I mean, to be compliant with the ordinance, it would be one lane, it would have four stacking spaces, we would eliminate this conflict here, and there you go. Um, and then it would meet the standards, it would be far less, uh, far less of an issue. The last uh, issue that I wanted to bring up is the uh, potential opportunity for 
uh, additional screening. Um, the the use is uh, or the, the use along here is single family residential. There is a wall there. Um, but there was no drive-through facility at the time that that wall and that situation was approved. Um, back in the day, we used to use a wall for everything, uh, you know, so just separating two uses, there it was. You do have cars, you probably, you know, admittedly are going to have more westbound traffic just using this exit here probably, you know, especially when Long Lake stacks up. I don't know if you've ever been there, you can kind of go here and see Long Lake is queued up past this driveway. You might shoot over here and then get it back in line that way just to go west on Long Lake. But. Um, uh, you know, it would be uh, it would be an addition right here, and you would have vehicles sitting here. You know, even in the evenings with the headlights on, and you've got a single-family home like right here. Um, what the new zoning ordinance would say in terms of screening, it would provide uh, you know, there's a, that new table, and there's screening alternatives A, B, and C. This would be a land use relationship that ideally would call for um, uh, for screening alternative. Um, I'm sorry, it's uh, alternative uh, three, not C. But the alternative three requires an evergreen tree for every 10 linear feet and a narrow evergreen for every five linear feet. And then it says, you know, and or a wall. So, I mean, I recognize the fact that you don't, you know, you could conceivably <laughs> use just the wall. You could conceivably use just landscaping, ideally, you know, possibly both. Um, but it says right in the ordinance, the Planning Commission has the, basically has the latitude to interpret this and try to get the best screening possible. Um, where a land use activity creates noise, light, dust, or other similar nuisance that cannot be effectively screened by a landscape buffer, a solid wall may be required. So you can see the wall is kind of the last resort, the wall on its own. Ideally, the first line of defense would be landscaping. Um, can you bounce to the bigger overall plan? Yeah, you can see right here there's two homes here. There is a massive surplus of parking on the site. You know, it may, it may be awkward to do so, it may not. Uh, you know, I'm sure the applicant, you know, it, it's not probably a site improvement that they had anticipated making. Maybe it's not something the Planning Commission cares about too much. There's definitely an opportunity here by losing parking spaces. You could increase the, you know, have a landscape buffer at least to here, which could soften that impact. But um, the only point that we wanted to make is that when this relationship was devised, obviously the ordinance provisions were, were actually more severe than they are now. You could get away with just landscaping now with no tree or with no wall. But, uh, you know, we feel like there is an opportunity uh, to do it here and maybe we should at least discuss the possibility of providing some sort of additional buffer here because this was not contemplated at the time that this relationship was contemplated. So we think it's at least important to have that discussion now. Um, in terms of uh, any other requirements of, of the, the city of Troy, there is one kind of biggie. There's a water main that goes right underneath this. <laughs> Uh, the water main does have an easement, uh, so they're not allowed to, to build on over the easement for the water main. Um, you'll notice in my review, I just uh, cited the city engineering department and stated that, of course, the water main would have to be relocated and a new easement recorded for that water main and the old easement abandoned in order for them to construct that. I'm sure Brent can fill you in a little bit more on the discussions between the applicant and the city in that regard. It's my understanding that the uh, um, uh, and maybe Alan even could uh, contribute to that conversation, but it's my understanding that the city is not uh, necessarily interested in allowing people to construct in the easement because um, there, you know, there, you could conceivably allow somebody to build the canopy and then they could remove the canopy if they ever had to do anything down there. Obviously, it would be a, a considerable expense. You've seen <coughs> the drawings of the canopy; it's pretty substantial. Um, but uh, at any rate, it would be a public <coughs> sewer. It would be a private sewer. So the city right. would be responsible to repair it if there were a leak. Correct. Yeah, it's a it's a e water main easement. So there there is uh, an issue there. And um, I mean, that's a detail typically we work out during final. I mean, it's not a, right. from a design perspective and an approval perspective. It's 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 something we we, we do we take care of at final. Just so, coordination. Yeah. But we just wanted the applicant to be aware of it. We put it out there, and there was a discussion about it and that. And so uh, I felt compelled to put it here in the review because right. uh, you know it's it's obviously a critical detail not to be missed. Um, from our standpoint, you can approve this. Conditional, uh, or you know, you, don't even, you wouldn't even have to condition it really, ultimately, because it's it's a utility issue and it's taken care of during final. Yeah. But nonetheless, it does affect the design of this building because right. They're gonna have yeah, to I mean, you know, if the, if the city didn't ultimately allow, you know, for something to be constructed through the easement, then the project would be a non-starter. You know, it would it, like like Brent said, you wouldn't necessarily have to condition any recommendation on it because they're not allowed to construct in the easement without separate and distinct approval for doing that or resolving the issue by relocating the water main easement, which of course would then solve the problem as well if the engineering department accepted it. Um, but that was, uh, that's my review. Thanks. Any questions, uh, Mr. Brannigan? Mr. Okay. Schultz? I have Maxwell. I just wanted to ask, Zach, you, you're recommending uh, one window, one uh, drop-off pickup window. 
Is that correct? Sort of uh, a individual drop off the couple windows? Uh, well, it, the reason that I bring that up is because the ordinance only permits single lane drive throughs in an area that's uh, most visible from a right of way like that. It just says that a double lane drive through uh, must be located on the site in the area that is least visible to the public right away. So, yes, that's what, in order to, all, you know, as I said, it's a consent judgment. The city has flexibility, but were this a conventional project, we wouldn't allow a double lane drive through in an area that was visible from Long Lake or as visible from Long Lake as this. Correct. But you're, we're not having two, you're not recommending two windows either. No, I would think that it should just. Well, I mean, or whatever. I mean, if the if you know, two the windows don't matter. It's the lanes that you know. It's well, the lanes two windows matter. versus one. If you have one window, allows for more stacking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, true. But uh, yeah, the big issue is the um, the big issue is like the when you're dealing with a double lane drive through. As I said, the ordinance language is conceived primarily to deal with bikes <coughs> that have three and four and five lane, and it's the you know the confluence of lots of cars that's the issue yeah. there. Right. You got a lot of circulation on that particular area because yeah. you can go. You got uh, two driveways coming mm -hmm. in and out. And you've got, uh, right. if you go to the driveway that's furthest to the uh, east, if you're coming out of that driveway and you're going to head west, you're going to have people mm -hmm. traffic coming west. Also, people turn around. We're going eastbound to westbound. Plus, there's a kind of turnaround lane from yeah. westbound to eastbound that people on the other driveway might go to. So, yeah, I mean, you have cars going in different directions. Absolutely. Yeah, you'd have turning movements going uh, this way, you'd have turning movements going this way, you know, coming from across and then coming out. You know, you have two lanes, you know, merging to go left here, but you know, yeah, right. So it seems like the simpler the better. That's that's kind of the issue, and yeah. given that that's a provision of the ordinance anyway, I was compelled sure. to put it in there. Yeah, I agree with that. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Schultz. My concern is long term. I totally support a drive-through, one lane or two lanes for a drugstore, but if this consent agenda or consent agreement is amended to allow this drive-through when drugstores get even bigger and this tenant decides to move away we have a drive-through and it could in fact become a fast food restaurant with a drive-through because we've approved the drive-through through the consent agenda or consent we've approved a pharmacy drive-through uh, specifically a pharmacy drive-through it wouldn't meet any of the standards I, I, I can support this if once the tenant leaves, it either has to be occupied by another pharmacy or the drive-through is dismantled and done away with. And it's my, um, it's, it's a good observation, Mr. Schultz. I believe, and I, I, I can't um, be the absolute expert on this, but I believe that what the consent agreement says is that uses in the zoning, that the former zoning district are permitted, uh, you know, so. The consent judgment, uh, Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the consent judgment says that all B2 uses are permitted. It, this is an issue I wanted to get into this really briefly. This is uh, these these consent judgments are kind of a pain, and the reason the reason they're a pain is because they all refer to the our old zoning district, our old zoning ordinance. Also, the last copy. So, so exactly, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. I've got, I've got it sitting on my shelf, and well, I can get to it. You might want to put one in the fireproof vault too. Right. So we still have a lot of a, a lot of consent judgments uh, on the books. So. Right. Uh, so B2 uh, drive through would have been permitted as Correct. a special land use. Mr. Taylor was special condition. Yeah. I think of special conditions. Special conditions, I'm sorry, yeah. A couple of questions, Zach. Do you know how high that screen wall is on the east property line? Um, I was there, and um, I can't remember off the top of my head if it was four or six feet. I apologize for not knowing. Didn't I think that it's six. Six. I want to say that it's six. I mean, it, it seems like, yeah. Has yeah. anybody else visited the yeah, site? You can confirm that. Yeah, I visited the site about two and a half weeks ago. And uh, just, it was really busy. I saw it from my car, and yeah, you're probably right. It's probably six. Uh, second question, if that striped area becomes a curbed area and is elongated by eliminating the... Uh, the barrier-free parking, and it was landscaped. Would that tend to address <coughs> the view from the right-of-way that the zoning ordinance doesn't approve or allow it to? Um, the, the the thing that I, I find a little bit humorous about that is that we're sitting in front of a parking lot, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not like we're it's a McDonald's, right. you know. I mean, so I'm just wondering if that would be a position that would somewhat address what the ordinance was requiring but still allow the mm -hmm. petitioner his two uh two lane two lanes yeah and that's that's sort of why i sort of softened the blow in that portion of my review and said you know this is technically what it what it says but you know there, there may be some room for latitude um we can of course obviously discuss mm -hmm. that with the applicant i would say that um especially if the planning commission felt that way 
if there was a layer of screening between where the cars were and the right of way, I mean that would certainly help. Uh, and there is there is parking, there is you know right of way landscaping, and that I mean it's it's back there. The ordinance says, you know, you know, in the area least visible from the right of way. You know, well the area least visible from the right of way is nowhere near the CVS. You know, the I mean, <laughs> would you say that the east facade of the CVS tenant is you know is significantly less visible from the right of way than this? I would say not. And also, it opens up a can of worms, you know, that A, they probably don't want it on the back of their building. I'm sure that their floor plan doesn't call for that. Second of all, you're right by the single family homes, which you don't want either. So, in order to allow this user the same entitlements as every other drugstore, we obviously have to have some flexibility. But your suggestion is well taken. Mr. Edmonds? Yeah, I, I have a question. It's probably more applicable to the uh, applicant than it is to the staff. But when I was out there, there's a it's a long distance between I'm from the east side of the building and by the way that is their pharmacy back there because I've been in there before it could it, I, I think it should be at least considered to have that drive-through window on the east side up near the front there's plenty of room to go down there and make a u-turn come back through the drive-through you mean and it wouldn't be on this it wouldn't even be on the front of the building be on oh, yeah you mean on the side of the building over here right up there at the front yeah right. yeah yeah the, you know the consideration there that i just mentioned is that it would just it would you know it would potentially even more impact a single but you have two-way traffic going down there right now there are, there are parking spaces on both the, the you know that lane going back there it's a very wide lane it's actually yeah, it's it's you know it's 24 feet. I think it's a, a typical two-way <coughs> maneuvering lane. I'm not sure. Plus parking spaces on both sides. It's part, yeah, and then you have this. Uh, you definitely have to. Uh, I'm not sure that there would be sufficient turning radius to actually have it there. You'd have to go all the way down to the end and come mm -hmm. back. So the, start, the turning radius out in the front parking lot is going to be what, bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Well, you come in here, and then you've got the ability to go wherever, and then here you would just have to make a, a 90. You know, here, if you were, I, I think what you were saying is that if you're coming up here, you would somehow turn around and then go yes. through the lane. Yes. I, There's I, plenty I, of room to do that. There, there might be. I'm not, I'm not confident that this would meet our standard for, you know, if we were to eliminate spaces on both. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I honestly, that's not an engineered solution that we would have considered, so uh, I, I don't know. Mr. Shred. Yeah. yeah, I uh, frequently uh, come to the center. Uh, and uh, frankly, uh, the driveway that is to the east, the furthest east, is very, very seldom used. This one here, yeah. Now, that entrance, and that primarily the entrance, yeah, the right drive there. coming in, no, no. The curb cut. Down the curb right cut. Right there. Yeah, right there. That is primarily for the purpose of having those semis coming through. The service access, yeah. In the back area. <laughs> And frequently, and you see more traffic coming into the front of the center than you do in the rear. You see very, very few traffic. I, I, uh, I like the uh, the concept that as it's drawn right now, and maybe the con, you know, the idea of having those two uh, uh, handicap removed from there might be a good idea. That's where they're currently at, and I'm sure they tried to minimize the amount of construction. But uh, you very, very seldom, when you're driving, especially going westbound, you're not even aware of the fact that that's right there because of the fact, as far as the exposure. So it's kind of hidden, really, in a way. And what John was talking about, I think I kind of concur that it kind of softens, and you softened that, as far as having it a double lane. I, I, I really think it's, uh, it's not a bad solution at all. And as far as the traffic uh, coming out, uh, I don't see much traffic coming in unless it's a semi or something going towards the back. Possibly employees or yeah. something. When I when I was there and visited the site, I, I you know I came in I came in actually this way and drove behind and then came through this way before I you know found everything. And you're right. I mean there was just a handful of cars in this area to be honest. And then actually most of this parking lot was empty as well. Yeah. Um, but it was, I mean, there's, you know, there, there is plenty of... On Saturday and Sunday, when, when there is the most activity, especially with the shopping center and the Kroger's that are there, you'll see that there, there really, there's very little traffic on that side. I, I guess the uh, applicant was going to... Yeah, I have the same concern yeah. that we had with Panera when they wanted to drive in the window. And that's, we got some close residents nearby. And... Maybe if you can uh, double stack some greenery in there for some buffering of the noise, that, that might be helpful. But I think it's important to consider that also. Well, I, I totally concur with uh, your comments in terms of taking out those parking spaces there and filling it in with some trees or something along there to create a buffer there. I think even though it is a high fence, I know it is a six-foot high fence there. 
but uh, that would uh, enhance that whole area. And I, you know, I don't know how the, you know, I, I'm sure the applicant will have a response to that, but the, uh, that was just a, one suggestion. Given that the wall is on the property line, that, that would be the only way to add additional sure, landscaping on right. the own site. So, uh, you know, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure of the viability of that, but I do, I, I think that, I mean, it's, it could be done. I mean, there's space to do it, and we certainly wouldn't miss those parking spaces. It certainly would, and I think it would improve that entire area, that little cuticle of a space there. Uh, uh, I think it would improve it by having a row of trees there to soften that. I, I think that's great. I think uh, you did an excellent job in your presentation, and I also agree with you with respect to the curb. I think that would enhance it as well. I, I think excellent. As far as that easement goes, so geez, you know, I think that even if they had an agreement where they would take down the canopy, and how frequent do you think they're going to actually excavate that area? I mean, that, one that, time well, is yeah, one time. One time is enough. Okay, that's an additional. There is an additional consideration too, and I'm not an engineer, but you know, from what Brent and I understood from the engineering department, as I said, they were also reluctant to do that because the construction of the canopy pylons. Mm -hmm. would actually cause additional impaction of the soil, which could actually negatively impact the existing main at that location and cause damage. Where is the easement at? It's right. It's right. Yeah, well, in is it there. shown on that drawing at all? It's, um, it's right. It's in the second, it, it, in the southern lane. Yeah, it's not in this drawing, but it's like right here. Is, that, is it between the manholes? There's two manholes shown there. I'm sure they're in the center of the easement. Is that, is that manhole there? Is that what that is? So, yeah, it shows two manholes. Now, let's see what oh. So it's going on an angle there. Existing man on one of the sheets. I'm sure it's on one of the sheets. Where did you see that? <coughs> I missed it. No, keep going here on the rock. Here you're going. Right there. Hold it. Oh, right, right there. there. Oh, there. Oh, yeah. yeah, if you look at the existing condition sheet, 17 of 30 in your digital packet. Yeah. You can see it page 17. It goes right across like the, the first few feet of the existing <laughs> little parking <laughs> space. Go <laughs> page 17. The drawing, you see the. The line. Mr. Maxwell? I uh, just want to mention that uh, I use this pharmacy pick up a newspaper to 4 or 5 o'clock, you know, several days a week. Usually, I, I use the easternmost driveway every single time. As Mr. Stratford ever does it, but I do. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> every single time I use that. Uh, usually, what I observe is the uh, first two rows of uh, parking yeah. places close to the building are usually fairly full at, at that time of day. So it's. Uh, uh, during the week, uh, at that time of day, it's, it's usually fairly busy, or reasonably busy on that side of the room. We're ready for the applicant. Uh, is the applicant present? Yes, sir. Why don't you come up and tell us who you are and uh, address any concerns you have uh, with our comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is John Gaver. I'm an attorney representing CVS. And with me, I have Jan Huffman, who's our district manager, <clears throat> who knows a lot about operations. And, how the store works, how it operates with and without uh, drive through So she'll be able to answer a lot of your questions, too. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate the thoroughness of, of staff and your consultant in looking through this. Uh, <clears throat> they raise a lot of good information. What we're trying to do is, is to, if we can, is to get your recommendation this evening, uh, with or without conditions, to, to City Council you know, of these plans so that we can move forward with, with this project. Um, the, the project description, I mean, you know, it's, it's the industry standard now to have a drive-through, and there are pros and cons of a drive-through, but, you know, CVS feels to stay uh, up with the competition that we really don't have a choice, that uh, even though, you know, there's some drawbacks as well, that we need to move forward with this, this type of project. So we uh, would ask your indulgence in that. Uh, the site plan, <clears throat> a lot of good information that, that's been described uh, on the site plan. Um, <clears throat> I think that in going through some of the, the, uh, the staff report comments, the consultant's report, uh, we are certainly willing to uh, take those two handicapped spaces and shift those to the other side of the building and extend the lanes by whatever that is, 20, 25 feet, uh, whatever that would be. That would, <clears throat> that would do two things. You know, I, I, we agree that that would uh, essentially eliminate some potentially conflicting traffic movements. And also, it would give us additional staffing capacity. Now, in the ordinance, has been mentioned, you know, four 20-foot, I think, length spots is what's requested. I don't know if we can fit that many in. If you look at that, <clears throat> those dimensions, I think we can do three, but I don't know if we can get four uh, for those dimensions. And <clears throat> the reason for the for the two lanes instead of the one, th there are a number of reasons. Um, you know, one is that uh, in terms of the pickup and the drop-off. 
Uh, both of these, the window and the pneumatic tube serving the outside lane, both of them can be used for pickup and drop off of prescriptions, you know, either one. Uh, we, have, we have some times of the day where it, it gets a little busier than others, and we do have backups, and we like to service our customers as best we can, which is why we would ask for two instead of one. Or if you get an issue with somebody in the window trying to pick something up and there's some type of a problem uh, with their order, then you know, people behind them obviously don't appreciate that which is why it's standard practice to, to ask for two and try to, <coughs> try to build these with two now instead of one. Um, one thing I would like to do, I'd like to pass out some, some information that we have. We took some photos and we have some, some traffic count information as well, but I think the uh, name of full disclosure will help to, to kind of <coughs> illustrate some of these issues that we've been discussing in a little more, a little more detail. Just so the Planning Commission knows we weren't provided with this in advance, so we have no idea what's in the packet. <laughs> and my apologies for that, but we, we just got this information together today, so I, I do apologize for that. Now, most, of them, most of them are photos of the existing store. You see from the different vantage points. Uh, I guess it was yeah. The first one shows the front. The second shows the rear where the, where the drive-through window would, would be located, at the back of that south facade. The third shows from Long Lake um, the view up at uh, that drive behind the store in the back. <clears throat> and the fourth is, is basically from the front of the store looking to the east uh, at the six foot wall and the, the neighbors behind that. And then I, I added the next drawing of a, another drive through. This is just an example of another drive through canopy, uh, basically the style that we would be adding here. To point out a couple of couple of features. First of all, if you look at this, and I apologize that the clarity is not, not better than it is, but really it only looks like if you, if you look at the structure and the canopy, it only looks like it covers one lane. It doesn't look like it covers two because the canopy, and we can look at the, the elevations and, and see that the canopy only extends about, let's see, about um, I think it's about five feet, possibly six feet into that second lane. Actually, I think it's closer to four or five feet <coughs> in that second lane. So you, you see the structure is just enough basically to cover the, the window area of the car between the window and where the pneumatic tube uh, dispenser is, that, that, uh, that yellow item on there. So, so it doesn't look like, even if we have two lanes, the, the pavement will be there, but it doesn't look like we have a big canopy like, <clears throat> like you see with, with banks and such, you know, jutting out quite a ways from the building. So the reason I, sh I included this drawing is to illustrate that purpose. And then we have after this some, some traffic information, which, which I'll get to as, as well. But a couple other points that I'd like to make on this drawing, the elevations that we have here. Uh, as you can see, you know, the style, the architectural feature, uh, the color, the materials and such it is, is set up to match what's currently there. The existing structure and the existing materials and color scheme. And you'll see that it's also got a standing seam roof on top of uh, uh, what's proposed here. To match, you know, the feature in the front of the building as well. So we're trying to we're trying to blend it into the building as, as much as possible to, you know, make sure that it doesn't stand out like a sword thumb. Make sure that it matches and looks like a natural part of the, the building facade. That's, that's where our objective is here. In terms of in terms of some of the issues that have been been mentioned, um, the curb landscape island obviously is something we would uh, be amenable to doing too. That would extend, uh, you know, back further to the to the west toward those you know, where the currently handicapped uh, parking spaces are. And we'll put some shrubs in there, something to, as Mr. Table noted, to kind of, you know, uh, soften the look uh, at the ground level. In addition to having the smaller canopy, we'll do that at the ground level too, which I think will be more static, obviously, from, from the south side. Um, you know the the ordinance. We understand what the what the ordinance says with regard to multiple drive-through lanes, but being located in a manner that will be the least visible from a public thoroughfare, it's it's one of those things. There's really nowhere else to put it. Um, and, and what our hope is as well is that if traffic is driving from the east to the west, it it won't be that visible because you've got the wall that comes all the way down, and many people will be, you know, their eyes and their attention will be focused on further up than where that canopy is. 
Um, we're also amenable to adding you know, whatever pavement markings uh, staff would would recommend and be added there to make sure that the, the turning movements are clear for the, for the traffic uh, that's there. So we don't have any problems with, with that particular request. In terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of traffic counts, that's something else I wanted to, to mention. These last two drawings, or pardon me, these last two charts in here, give you an indication of, uh, this is what CVS shows for their average stores in terms of traffic or pardon me, use counts for the for the drive through. As you can see by the by those graphs, essentially we're talking 80, maybe 80 to 100 users per day uh, total uh, for the for the drive throughs. And you can see it's broken down by pick up and drop off if you're interested. And then the last page of my handout talks about the timing uh, that these will be used. There, Basically, I, th I think Jamie said the turnaround time is, is, is approximately two minutes. Yeah, two, between two and three minutes. Two and three minutes transaction. per transaction. So, and if everything's operating, you know, properly, that's that's what it would be two to three minutes. So, so even though you have this usage spread out, uh, it's not as though it's a McDonald's where you have cars constantly going through. Uh, you minimize this to you know, roughly 15 minutes per peak hour during during the weekday. Week. So this is this is the information I'd like you to take a look at as well, please. If you could. Um, in terms of the other conditions that are set forth in the staff report, I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. Yeah, Raymond, could you address the landscaping uh, butting the uh, residential area? Yeah, well, we would we would suggest. You know, obviously, we we've looked into that. We've talked to the landlord about it too. I mean, we would rather not be required to do that. And the reason being is that we think number one, uh, the houses are far enough away. If you look at this drawing; they're roughly 70 feet away. I think that the wall is from the uh, where the cars are. If you scale that out, and secondly, we think the six foot fence is sufficient. It has been sufficient in the past, and we think that's that's. You know, currently sufficient uh, to, to block them off. There is some landscaping, obviously some trees they have on, on their side. But uh, you know, this is really their this is really their backyards. And I understand you know some of the concerns that we may be you know, uh, enhancing our use here. So therefore, you know, we don't want the lights shining there. Um, one thing to look at is is where, where our maximum use will be is, is you know during during the rush hour time period probably according to those charts. And if that's the case, I mean, essentially, you've got, if it's light out, it's not an issue. If, if it's dark out in the winter time, you know, it, chances are that it shouldn't interfere much because people aren't out in the backyard at nighttime in the winter time doing certain activities <coughs> like they would be in the summertime. So we would just ask you to, to you know, take that into consideration. We would rather not be required to do that because of you know, the cost factor because Excuse me. It, it's difficult working with the landlord uh, on some of these issues, such as that one, um, and we just don't think it's going to provide any really any additional screening. Obviously, it'd be nice aesthetically. It would be nice to have that whole wall, have a tree barrier along that whole wall. We can appreciate that, uh, but uh, and we would just ask your indulgence to uh, uh, see if we can dispense with that requirement. Uh, yeah, just to be clear uh, to the applicant and to everybody else, uh, our main consideration for the addition of landscaping there, and you'll see in the ordinance, um, you know, the idea behind additional landscaping and using that instead of a wall is not a not necessarily a concern of headlights, it's of noise, especially with the drive-through, because you remember that was the reason that Panera Bread uh, lost the, uh, their, their request to, uh, to add a drive-through in a very similar circumstance was because of objection from the adjacent neighbors in terms of the noise from the loudspeaker and the ordering. So it's not as much a question of, of the lights. I can appreciate that an opaque wall, you know, primarily does block the headlights, um, but there would be an additional softening acoustic effect of putting uh, the trees up in that area. So I just wanted to be clear that that's an additional consideration when we're discussing uh, the screening. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a clarification point, though? When and then one thing that I could take back to my clients is, is you know, when you're talking about putting some trees there, are you talking about right in front of the area, like you know, three spots in front of the area, four spots in front of of the drive-through, or are you talking, you know, 
20 spots along that wall. Uh, probably not 20 spots. I would probably say that what we were considering is, uh, you know, obviously it'd be sort of awkward if there was just a patch of three or four parking spaces, but possibly from the entrance drive up to where the end of the the drive-in is. So not quite 20 spots. I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You know, maybe, you know, 12 spots or 11 spots well, or something, or even or you know, e or less. You know, even if it was, you know, not just the three here, but you know, I mean, maybe you know, five or six or something of that nature. I mean, and it was. You know, we, we, we also didn't come to an engineered solution for it. It's just that that's a, you know those are the potential alternatives that would be allowed under the ordinance. I can tell you now that if this project were to come in today, there wouldn't be a wall at all. Probably it would probably instead have about a 20 foot landscape. There would be no parking here. There would just be a real dense landscaped area. Probably the entirety of the site with maybe a berm. Yeah, all the ordinance doesn't. The rain gardeners. Yeah, but, uh, you know, at any rate, it would probably be a dense opaque landscaping screen that would extend, right. you know, at least 20 feet across this whole area. So we're sort of left with the legacy of the wall, um, which, you know, we, we obviously understand that these neighbors and stuff are, are accustomed to it. It's part of, of their property, but that was... Um, Mr. Tatum? You know, I just want to add to this discussion is if, if you make that change, you've kind of now framed a, the, what's happening in that corner is a little different than just somebody zipping down that drive right now just seeing that there's you know parking space is the way it is so you have created a little bit of a uh, you know i'm going to stop and look a little bit more a little bit more of a consciousness of what's going on there so i think it would really reinforce a safety aspect of this as opposed to uh what what uh zach saying about uh, about noise and light and such in additional consideration mr taylor i mean you know this is not a good drawing for it obviously because this is sort of an older plan but you know, when you see, like, for instance, you know, a lot of ordinances require, you know, these long strings of parking to be broken up. Right. And in our new ordinance now, you know, we require parking lot landscaping. So if somebody were to come in and do spaces like this, every 10 spaces or so, they would have a bump out that would be like a parking space or two parking spaces wide and create a 400 square foot little patch of landscaping there. So, I mean, even if it was just a handful of five or six spaces right here, I definitely agree with you. Basically, it would be like a traffic calming effect, and then it would also be just kind of like a parking lot landscaping island that would sort of separate this, you know, service area from the customer area here, and then it would, you know, it additionally provide the acoustic effect there. I mean, you could still have five or six parking spaces right here, and then it would just end, come up, and then probably match off with the existing, you know, thing there. And, and that's something we may be able to get the landlord to agree to. I, I don't think there's a chance he's going to agree to remove all those spaces, 11, no. 12 spaces, yeah. but he may agree to that. Um, I don't have authority from CVS to say yes to this, but you know, obviously if it's something, if, if you move forward and recommend this and have it as a condition, then if CVS agrees to it, that's, that's great. If they don't, then we'll probably be back here having another discussion in terms of you know, what alternatives could work uh, in that situation. Any questions, uh, Mr. Yeah. The only other uh, question was, uh, did the applicant have any response to the water main issue? That's the only issue we didn't discuss. Uh, not that we, you know, as Brent said, we don't have to solve that here. I just wondered if there was. Right, the water main issue, well, we just got the staff report on Friday, so we just started looking at it. Um, they're looking at solutions for doing this. I, I mean, they, as to how to run it, uh, they may be able to run it on a diagonal so they don't need you know, as many manholes uh, and such, but that's what they're looking at right now. They understand the concerns that the city has about from a construction and a maintenance standpoint. Um, you know, our preference obviously would be to keep it where it is, uh, to just sign up whatever documentation with the city <coughs> to, to, to ensure that if there's an issue where you know, the canopy has to be removed or some improvements have to be removed, that would be our responsibility, the, the property owner's responsibility and not the city's responsibility. In the easement right now that the city uh, has for this water main easement, there's nothing in there about uh, restoration, damage. Uh, it's, it's just silent. It's just a base, basic easement. It doesn't have those. But there's no buildings in there now. No, 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 no I understand. But there's nothing no, about no, repairing no, or restoration no. or damage. And down to these, uh, there's none of that language that you typically see in, in uh, easements these days. Mr. Strand? Yeah, talking about that easement, uh, if something did break like you were talking about, I don't know what your footings and foundations are going to be undermined. I mean, it's going to be a major thing. So I think those pillars are absolutely nothing in comparison to the building itself or the columns that are there right now. But you may have to relocate those columns further out. Maybe you're going to lose that effect that you were talking about with the cantilever. And maybe you're going to have to go to the end of it uh, and extend the canopy. But uh, I, I think that uh, there's 
<laughs> undermining those footings that <laughs> they didn't know that happen. Mr. 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 I think the cost of relocating them, the wiring is nominal compared to the relocating the footings or anything. It's very, you don't require any manholes. So. Yeah, we're just we're still it's evaluating your rents. It's pretty nominal. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll do it for five thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Tagle, on the drawing that shows the building elevation, the area where the canopy is showing abutting the building. The the dark the brick is is dark in there, and I'm just wondering, are you planning on doing anything different with that brick? See, see where the darker yes, brick is? Yes, I do. What, what is that all about? Well, it was my understanding from talking to the architect that that was supposed to match uh, the rest of the building. <laughs> it was already brick there, isn't it? I mean, according to the yes, photograph, the photograph yeah. shows it's already brick. Yeah, yeah, it's already brick. So I don't know, I don't know why that would be, why that would be any different, why that would be changed. It might just be showing new construction versus existing. I think yeah, that's yeah. what I was just going to suggest, just to differentiate the new versus the old there. But, but it's supposed to blend in. If that's you know, if that's one of the conditions, then, then so be it. But I, I think in these in these drawings, unfortunately the architect couldn't be here tonight, but I think in these drawings it says that, it shows that. I'm not sure what that chart at the top left shows, that table. Well, see, my there. point from that photograph, mm -hmm. it's already there. It's already there. Right. So I'm not sure what, and again, if that's intended as new brick, I'm not sure why. It's or painted. <laughs> well, I'm going to cover it with ethos. No, I, I, think it's, I think it's just highlighting it. But that, I don't think that's the intent. Okay. The intent is for it to blend, to look the same. I mean, that would be perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Schultz. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else, but I would have difficulty making a recommendation to City Council on this without having revised drawings. Mm -hmm. And uh, so personally, I would move to table this to our next meeting to allow the uh, petitioner to provide revised drawings of the drive-through with the landscape island and the handicapped spaces removed. And I would also like to see dwarf trees in the landscape island rather than shrubs. I'd like to see something that might actually screen the, the appearance of the vehicles just a little bit. Because in the past we've had, and I'm not saying that it would happen in this case, but in the past we've had petitioners agreed to put in shrubs and we ended up with these things about this big from Frank's nursery. Mm -hmm. And You're dating yourself. It, it, meant, it meant the letter of the law, but it didn't meet the intent of the request. Let's okay. put it that way. There's a motion to table. Is uh, Mr. Tate's Second. Yep. Any discussion on the motion? Wait a minute. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. Um, Theoretically, if they get this to us soon enough, we can get it on in two weeks. Oh, I said. So we'll so we'll get, try next well, meeting. For mm -hmm. Next meeting. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. I, I would just like to get a little more clarification, if I could, in terms so that we come back with what you're looking for, if, if that's possible. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Well, I would suggest that uh, rather than me try and summarize for you, you been here listening to us and you've seen our concerns and I think that you can probably discuss it with Brent. Discuss it. Yes, thank you. Discuss it with Brent uh, in more detail than uh, to try and get us to come to an agreement tonight. And so in fact, we don't know whether the motion's going to pass or not. Yet. Well, I know. That's why uh, <laughs> we're going to take a vote now. <laughs> yeah, can we have a vote, please? Mr. Maxwell? Uh, yes. Mr. Sanzika? Yes. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Strat? Yes. Mr. Table? Yes. Mr. Holman? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Henson? Yes. Mr. Crane? Yes. About that as soon as you can. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank so you. Before you run through the drive-thru, but. He does. He does. I've been waiting for it for two weeks. I like the idea, like you said, it visually you know, tells people something's happening here. It's a change. Just be aware of what's going to happen. I think we should also take that. it out. Here, mm -hmm. this one out here. Some these answers will come straight out. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they can't turn right there anyway. The next item is the study item, which is the potential revision of the plenary site plan approval. File number SP921, which is the Briggs Park condominium on the east side of Rochester. 
The north side of Lamb, section 14, is currently zoned RT, which is one family attached residential and EP, environmental protection, and R1C, which is one family residential districts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Some of you were on the planning commission uh, back in, in 2005 when uh, Briggs Park received, Briggs Park Condominium received preliminary site plan approval from the planning commission. It received final approval in, on September 28, 2006, uh, following which they uh, commenced construction. The approved layout was for 54 units, and the 54 units were within 16 buildings, so obviously they were attached units, three and four unit buildings. Uh, to date, there have been 12 units constructed out of the, out of the 54 units, so um, the, the economy has affected the, the build out of this, of this development. So what the, uh, what the applicant has, intends to do is to redesign the site and replace 42 proposed attached units in 12 buildings with 35 unattached units, so basically essentially standalone units. So this, would, this is going to result in a uh, seven unit decrease on the site that's going to decrease density on the site. They're not proposing to change the, uh, the relationship of the buildings to either the street or the perimeter, perimeter property line. In other words, the setbacks aren't going to change, so no, they're not going to be any closer to the neighbors. And the, uh, the site is zoned RT, which permits detached residential dwellings, so it's, it does comply with, with our provisions. They only provided us with a sketch, so we didn't do a full-blown review. It just provided us a sketch to show layout. Um, and the master plan classifies this area as Rochester Road Green Corridor, which does contemplate residential development. So it's consistent with the master plan. So this is, uh, this is the site. You can see uh, it's still, uh, still kind of a, an active construction site because only 12 of 54 have been developed. Here you see the zoning R RT abutting R R1C to the, to the east, and the, there's a small patch of EP up to the north. This is what was approved, 54 units in, this, in 16 buildings. And this is a typical uh, floor plan of the attached units and elevations for the, for the, the approved units. And this is what they're proposing, and you can see um, what, what are, have been constructed are here, these attached, and they're proposing detached here. Again, seven fewer units on the site. Got some proposed floor plans for these individual units, standalone units, provided elevations and color renderings of what these are going to look like. Mm. Nice. And with that said, I'd like to give the, the uh, potential petitioner an opportunity to, to talk and uh, but, uh, their, their intent is to kind of get some, get some feedback from the Planning Commission on what you think of this proposed p potential change and uh, take it from there. Who's going to do it? I guess I'll start. My name is Alex Bogaris. I'm the architect. And, uh, Mr. Bogarts, can you stand by the microphone to make sure that our viewing audience can also hear you? Thank you. Okay. I'm Alex Bogarts, architect for the petitioner. We uh, had the opportunity to do the original design of the project and have been involved with uh, the developer now to come in and propose an alternative way to com complete the property. Uh, because of, primarily because of uh, economics, uh, we find that we're getting a lot of resistance to the attached product, and so the owner is willing to drop density, bring about a detached unit. And uh, matter of fact, one of our units, the unit that's both on the <coughs> left and right of that rendering, is one of the, one of the units that is in the development right now that we've simply taken as a detached plan, the first floor master bedroom. One in the middle will be a classic two-story. Excuse me. And uh, really what uh, our amendment went over is really what, uh, that is really the sum total of what we're proposing to do. We have some buildings existing. We've not had any sales for two years, essentially of, of, of any, is that, is that, how many, how many units have we sold in the last two years? Um, or have you sold? Well, we, we, we've made some, you know, uh, you want to stand by, go to the podium. Yeah, 
Mr. Randazzo. <coughs> We've done some uh, sales that have been more like land contract and lease with option to buy, but as far as the conventional way of selling, hasn't done real well. And we can't build them. They cost more than what we're selling them for. They're just not a market right now. Another thing we're doing too, if you have a chance to scan back through your materials, the earlier elevations we had had uh, quite a bit of siding on the exterior at the street front. Uh, that building right there in the bottom rendering, uh, all those upper gables on those units are all siding. And when you scan back into our rendering, our color rendering, we are doing a significant amount of brick, which is what, again, what the, the buyer is looking for today. They want detached, they want brick, they want to be as much like as close to a single family home lifestyle as possible. And we are, frankly, we're very excited about the product. Uh, we we uh, hope the city can look at this with a, with a, a like mind to where we're trying to go with it. We think we're gonna bring something uh, very handsome to the community. We're up, we believe we're upgrading the site and we're dropping density and, uh, and that's really our pre presentation. Uh, as I said, I'm the architect. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Schultz. And Danazo is the developer, and Brad Bajowski is, uh, is also on the development team people. Mr. Schultz, um, looking at your sketch and assuming you're going to at some point formally propose something very similar, you're saying that there would be a minimum of 12 feet between each of these freestanding units and I grew up in Berkeley, which has a whole lot of neighborhoods, single-family neighborhoods, that the houses are only 12 feet apart. And I have no problem with it. I think it would be actually be an improvement over what was originally proposed, and I would support it. I agree. I think this is a nice way of trying to remedy a problem with economics, and the appearance is good. It's less dense. Uh, I encourage you. Mr. Tango? Um, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at our uh, at our master plan document, uh, but if you haven't, I'd like you to look at that and see what amenities, what pedestrian amenities you could start to put in this development. Other, obviously, we're just looking at the buildings right now, but you know, whether it's walking paths or whatever it might be, uh, stormwater management techniques, something because we are on Rochester Road, which has been classified as the, the green corridor. So anything that you can do to bring this development more in line with what we're trying to develop along Rochester Road, I would think that would go a long way. Yeah, I'd be happy to discuss that with the developer, and I'm sure that's something we can try to work with the community on. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Sensi? That's a point we'll take, Mr. Chigel. Uh, you know, large detention basins, retention basins, you know, that was a vote several years ago, but now, you know, bioswales, rain gardens, things like that, I think would be very favorable on this site, especially if you have the room to do it in the side yards. And uh, you can still, uh, you know, uh, maintain the same value with those other amenities. And, and I believe there would be a credit with our new ordinance, too, if um, we were talking about in our ordinance earlier today. So I think that's a point we'll take, Mr. Chico. I'm glad you brought that Chair. Sure. Mr. Stratt. Yeah, I totally concur with that. And in your earlier scheme, you had a, uh, a pathway that I thought was just like an excellent opportunity to create some sort of a bioswale, some activity and bridges going across or whatever. Uh, and you can really enhance this uh, in that direction so that we could have uh, like little seating areas. Uh, I, I think that uh, as indicated, our uh, new ordinance is really trying to promote that more than anything else. And I think that we may be even giving some credits. I'm not sure, but uh, at this point. Absolutely. Anyone else? Good evening, Brad Byerski. Uh, Mr. Strat, I, you may recall, I think there's, it's very lightly depicted on this plan. Uh, Brian, running between like the three units right through the middle, there's kind of a path shown. Yeah, I see the path. I think that was originally designed as a, a, a impervious path or a pervious path system. And it runs through the ponds, which are back in the upper corner. I saw that. I saw that. Okay. I, I didn't see that. And I just, I wanted to note that the ponds are already constructed. I understand. Well, and I know that you've got all your underground in, so you can actually go and actually the 
The idea here is to, as you know, the bioswales is to actually slowly slow down the activity of the stormwater so that it's not going into the ponds. But uh, you could actually uh, design it around the existing cur uh, catch basins that you do it. Well, and I asked Brent the question. My recollection was along the uh, east property line there, we did construct a bioswale back in there. And I'm not certain of that. We had to check that. I couldn't remember if that was what we did at Caswell or it was there. Yeah, I don't think that, you know putting bio swales just to put bio swales is not really the answer. No, I it's think part it's of the more, storm system. Well, that also and try to make it so that you're making your compromises work for you, not against you. So you make a feature out of them. Right. That's the key is to to enhance it, not uh, not just to create a bio swale and call it a rain garden and there's nothing there. <laughs> Anything else? I think we like it. Uh, that's great. Okay. We look forward to uh, refining this presentation, coming back before the community, and uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mayor? Yes. Well, I'm here in my office. Give me a call. Give me a call. I'll, I'll call you tomorrow. Okay. I'll be in my office. It's a beautiful house. Item 10, public comment for items on the current agenda. Seeing none, we will go on to Planning Commission comments. Let's start with Mr. Tegel. Um, I want to thank Brent. Um, I think it was a week before last, uh, the uh, Convention Bureau of Detroit, okay, they're, they're doing a survey of areas where a new Convention Bureau may be well placed in the south, in southeast Michigan here. Um, Troy is one of the sites they're looking at. The Aeropropolis is one of the sites. Uh, Auburn Hills, Dearborn. And Brent came and represented the city, talked about our, our master plan, and talked about Big Beaver. So I just want to thank you publicly for coming in and being part of that and providing some information for the uh, the consultant that was there. Uh, so thanks. You're welcome. Mr. Pratt. Mr. Stratt? Yeah, I had a couple of items. I, uh, uh, I didn't say anything prior, but that was site plan approval, and typically on our site plan approval, we do ask for the seals to be on the drawing. <laughs> there was a seal on that drawing. So I'm going to be looking <laughs> for that. Uh, yeah, the, you, you got me, Mr. Strat. What, 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 <laughs> no, I didn't. What, I didn't what, want what, to make what, an issue there, on it. What happens is um, we, we get the, the hard copy, and we only ask for one hard yeah. copy, and that one's sealed, and then we give you the electronic and they're not, there's no electronic seal. And in this instance, if this is my fault. Um, I neglected to call the developer and said, hey, bring hard copies. So that's on me that we didn't have the hard copies in front of us tonight with the seals. Well, I'm looking for yeah. the seals that's on, on, me. on the drawings. Uh, and there are ways that they could actually put the seals on the, on the electronic version too. Uh, there have been some that have been on it, but that, that was the big thing. I also think that the comments that were made, uh, Brent, were very good, uh, as well as for SAC. Uh, I really appreciated the comments that were made aesthetically on that uh, ZBA building or the uh, the pharmacy. But that's it. Mr. Maxwell. Uh, no comment. Mr. Matson, you want to chime in? Uh, I was just going to mention the hearing in the Grand Sockwell cases tomorrow morning. Okay. Will we all attend? Uh, <laughs> might help, I don't know. <laughs> What's the hearing subject? Uh, it's the hearing on the motion <coughs> by the Grand Sakwa to uh, to get the property back, okay, basically. Right. This is the big one tomorrow. Right. Okay. Well, okay. Mr. Seven? Nothing to add. Mr. Brandon? No. Nothing Kathy, you want to say anything? No, All right. Mr. Sanzika? I just wanted to uh, mention I did attend the Zoning Board of Appeal meeting last week, and I want to compliment Mr. Strat for his perseverance. And, uh, I was surprised that, you know, the, the uh, zoning board did re require that they do a, a traffic study for the Chaldean Church. And that's exactly what we echoed at the Planning Commission. And, and there, there was a much better uh, way to, for that property to be, for entrance and exit into the property than what they had proposed. And I think, uh, I was just surprised that it had gotten that far. It was several postponements before they finally got the idea to, uh, to do a traffic study. So I uh, like, again, I like to comment Mr. Stratt and the Zoning Board of Appeals for their perseverance. And uh, it was quite an interesting meeting, I have to say. They um, they had uh, three votes on the uh, for the chairman. Oh. They couldn't decide on who the chairman would be. It was a tie for three times. We had six people there. Who is the chairman? Steinberg. Is that? 
The same. I'm sorry, they who? The same. Dave Lambert. And uh, Martin was uh, nominated himself. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting meeting. I'll make a comment on that. Uh, what had happened was that uh, they were there the time before. The first meeting they postponed, then they showed up for the second meeting, and that meeting took almost two hours. And it was very, very, uh, they really wanted to palm that thing through. Finally, we got to the point where it was postponed, and then they didn't show up for the postponed meeting, and that's when we said, hey, enough is enough, or at least I felt enough is enough. They just refused to get a traffic engineer to come in and redesign. Or re they, they, their interpretation of the traffic engineer was to come in with some calculations. That is not what the intent was, at least by this body. Mr. Ullman. Uh, Mr. Savinen, could, could we have the results of what the final disposition from the engineering department was on those two previous uh, dog hotels as to how they uh, handled the waste treatment? Final, uh, yeah. final disposition? Well, we made some recommendations and then it had to go to engineering and I was just kind of curious how that all was worked out. Um, you'll have to give me uh, some, uh, some time to okay. find, the, find out. Well, it'd be kind of handy but to see how we handled the last two when we get to this one that's coming up. Then. Okay, thank you. Mr. That did turn out very, very well. Have you been by it? No. Oh, it is really, uh, what an improvement from an existing facility. It, yeah, it's, it's, it really it's is incredible transformation. I oh think. gosh, I'll say, what an improvement to that entire area. I think, and then honestly, what they, the 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 short short version is that the one of the alternatives that we had discussed at the meeting was that the areas where the dogs would, um, you know, that like preliminary area, it's covered, and then that area goes into the sanitary. So if they go, that's under the cover, and then they're let out into the greater yard. And I mean, if they tinkle a little bit out in the greater yard, there's not a lot you can do about that, but they. You know, there's like a holding area, and they want to do their business. And then once they've done their their primary I business, I think we should require diapers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Edmonds. Yes, I I think it was probably at least a couple of months ago. I think we were all rather unanimous in, in uh, looking forward to a, a joint meeting with the engineering department. Uh, um, stormwater management. Stormwater management, and I'm just curious as to where. You know, we, we have really light agendas. It's this is a this would have been a perfect uh, time to have something like that. Um, would you like to propose a motion? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just I'd like to hear from staff where where, where we're at. On it. I haven't had any dialogue with engineering yet. Sorry, with I, that I just I've dropped the ball, I guess. Well, you know, it's been raised. You know, Make a motion. I've been on the commission for at least a couple months and or for uh, close to two years now and this you know even uh, Mr. Sanzica's wife has offered to you know to uh, to uh, conduct that a study session on that so if, if you really do need a, a motion and I, I think it's it's apparent that would uh, this this uh, board would like to see it happen I don't need a motion Mr. Sanzica can you commit to your wife being here next month <laughs> I can ask her. We can work with Mr. Sanzi. Will Mr. Um, Vendette be here also? I can't. I cannot. Uh, I cannot obligate Mr. Vendette to come to this meeting. You're the same blue diamond, I believe. Bill would be good. I've talked to Bill. You heard? I don't. He, I, Bill doesn't work for me. I can. I can ask. Yeah. Him. I mean, I. I understand that, but he's the. I've talked with him about this. If you would like, if the Planning Commission would like a stormwater presentation in, in uh, June, and uh, I can pull someone in, done deal. Great. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Schultz. In an attempt to alleviate the sealed document issue that is continually arising, perhaps our planning consultant as the first item in their report could put a bullet that says the master copy of these documents are appropriately sealed by the. I can find out with a phone call. I don't. I don't get a physical copy either. I get a physical copy. Oh, I guess now. I, now I'll get a physical copy and we'll make sure that one is sealed. So sure, that's no problem. That way, as we're reading through it, it says even though the digital copy may not be sealed, we do in fact have a sealed copy on file, and perhaps that can satisfy the requirements. What I have concern with is that 
I don't want to see civil engineers architectural or architectural uh, ceiling civil engineer drawings. That is right. So that is my, my concern, as I'm sure it's yours as well. I wouldn't dare see the architect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that Carlisle Wartman Associates can verify <laughs> that drawings are appropriately sealed. Okay. Well, then this meeting is adjourned. Great. Most architects.